today on the Run to the Top podcast. However, what you want to do is think about, okay, how do I want to feel after the race? When, you know, I lift my hands off my knees and I've gotten, you know, some oxygen back to my brain. How do I want to feel? And what do I want to get out of this experience? Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Sinead Hockey. Hi everyone, Sinead here with you for this latest episode of Run to the Top, brought to you by Runners Connect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Whether you're listening to this on your run or maybe during your commute, I hope you're having a great day so far and that you enjoy this podcast. This week, we're speaking with runner, counselor, and sports psychology consultant, Adrian Langelier. A Woodlands, Texas native, Adrian combines her own athletic experience with a background in applied sports psychology to help runners of all levels reach their potential. She's a regular contributor to Stack Sports Magazine, as well as the Huffington Post, and she loves helping people hurdle the mental roadblocks so common in running. I can't wait to hear Adrian's advice on mental game. So after a quick break to thank our sponsor, we will jump right into our interview. Thank you so much to Pacific Health Labs for sponsoring Run to the Top and for giving our listeners free samples of their all-natural Excel gels. Learn more on how to get your free samples at the end of this episode and check out Pacific Health Labs at runnersconnect.net forward slash Pacific Health. Hey, Adrian. Hey, Sinead. How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. Well, we are excited to have you. So, Adrian, you and I were just talking a little bit before the interview. You are a runner down in the Woodlands, Texas, and you're also a yeah. sports psychology consultant down there. So first off, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got into running? OK, well, I, I like to describe myself as I was kind of like a lost or displaced runner all along. Even like when I was a little kid, I, I always liked it. I was the I was that girl who we'd have to run the mile in PE and I'd go out there and I'd just go as hard as I could and give it my all and everything like that. And here's the kicker. Everybody was complaining and to fit in, I'd lie. They were like, oh, God, we're running the mile today. And I'm just like inside. I'm like, oh, sweet. Let's see if I can beat my time. <laughs> but uh, in, but what I'd actually say is like, oh, man, we're going to die. I hate this. Um, so I was, you know, <laughs> not the, mo- not the most uh, secure kid growing up, apparently, if I was hiding that. But uh, anyway, so I, I got a little more serious about it in my teen years. And I mean, ran in junior high. I mean, not that that really means anything, but had had some success. I think I still have my district medals from like age 13, 14 and whatnot. Uh, then came a crippling case of performance anxiety. I had had the success and growing up being a really shy kid, the cross country coach would like follow me around in the halls of the high school, like trying to recruit me. And, Oh, I wanted to play volleyball. I wanted to play soccer. I wanted to hide, you know, from having every, all eyes on me. And, uh, I find that so ironic now is because performance anxiety is something I see basically on a daily basis. So I, you know, I start a lot of my talks and tell a lot of clients this is, I needed myself so badly when I was, you know, a young athlete and in high school, I kind of had to become that in a sense, but, uh, running took a different, you know, took a different shape when I, in my teen years, whereas what I did to stay in shape for soccer, you know, pretty typical, you know, I became the soccer player converted back into a runner, got to college, didn't run in college. You know, I probably had the ability and the potential to do so, but, you know, things just kind of end up the way they do. And, uh, I start thinking, Hey, you know, I think I might want to try a race eventually because I uh, worked as a personal trainer. So, um, you know, I was kind of ex- started to get some exposure to, okay, how the mind works with sport and exercise and all that kind of stuff. And I was around people who were signing up for five K's and doing triathlons and all that kind of stuff. And that's when like the fear of missing out hit me. And I was just like, maybe I want to give this another go. 
So I started, you know, upping my mileage and stuff like that and probably shoes that were ill-fitting and everything. <laughs> I'm an undergrad at Texas A&M and uh, eventually move on to grad school. And I had a professor at the time who was a runner and he just kind of asked us, this is physiological psych. I'll remember, uh, I'll never forget this at Sam Houston State. First day of my master's program, who in here runs? So I raised my hand and he's like, oh, well, we have a club that meets at the state park. You should come. So I show up and they talk me into doing a 5K. I show up for that too. Not very prepared. I stumble in first female on this little local 5K and I'm like, dang, I'm still good. <laughs> I'm like, let's keep doing this. Sign up for a half marathon, uh, end up, it was, I had no expectations other than survive it and all that kind of stuff and just get some experience. Yay me. You know, I ran double digits and ended up first female in that too. And I'm just like, okay, we're going to pursue this. So I was very fortunate that, you know, I do, you know, I've always been passionate about it, but I have a little bit of natural ability at the same time. And I went on, ran for Brooks uh, for a little bit, uh, ran for Wazell. And currently, you know, I have some experience uh, running as a local elite in Houston. So I can say that I've gotten my butt kicked by Shalane Flanagan. <laughs> that was a great, that, you know, that was a great experience right there. It was, it was an honor to be on the start line with, you know, her and I think a, a few other Olympic trialists. You know, after racing, you know, sponsored and all that kind of stuff for a few years. Injuries kind of caught up. So went back into some lost years, but never, you know, I'd always train when I could. So recently I've been able to train pretty seriously. I do about 50, 60 miles a week now. And I run lo locally for a club called the Houston Harriers. I actually training for my fall season right now. So that's kind of my history as a runner. You know, I've known some success. I've known setbacks. And I think that's kind of the perfect setup for working on the mental side of running because I've seen the good, bad and the ugly. And I think that's really valuable to, you know, runners of all levels that I work with. How I got into the field itself is I've always been just fascinated by how people operate. You know, I'm a lifelong athlete, wasn't necessarily successful in uh, anything involving hand-eye coordination, but I tried. So sports were my thing. When I was in high school, I started thinking, okay, I think I'd like to get into counseling and all that kind of stuff. I was always told by friends that I was a good listener and everything. So entered uh, Texas A&M University as a, as a uh, psych major, you know, got my bachelor's degree in psych. And when I was in college, friends started telling me, why don't you become a sports psychologist? And I remember the first time I heard it, I was just like, that's too hard. I'm like, there's like five of them in the whole world. I'm like, this is a pipe dream. Fortunately, I had a professor who kind of helped who one of his areas was sports psych. So I spent probably countless hours in his office picking his brain, figuring out how the field works, how I can actually make a career of it. So I can say that it started as an undergrad where I started thinking, OK, maybe this actually can happen. So went on, got my master's in clinical psychology, and I'm also a licensed professional counselor in Texas, which I think that background is very, very helpful because I can work with not just the performance aspect, but the whole person in general. Like I always like to say, I work with people who just happen to be athletes. A line that I get a lot of weird looks at, at the start of a session is when I say, are you a runner or are you this? Are you a swimmer? And they're just like, of course I am. What the, you know, why do you ask me that? And I say, no, you're a person. Mm -hmm. Running is what you do. So that's kind of a principle that I, I operate on with, with others. So got my master's and uh, end up just getting out in the field and doing general counseling work. You know, you have to be prepared to work with different avenues and stuff like that, especially starting out. Then I just decided, okay, I'm going to actually start putting myself out there and start, you know, it's basically saying, OK, let's get some athletes in and, you know, getting really boning up on mental training techniques and started seeing, you know, one or two athletes a month or something like that. It was very small and it just kept building every year. Present day, I think what I work with is probably about 85 to 90 percent athletes on a weekly basis. And, you know, it's just absolutely awesome that I can you know make a living and make a career helping people, you know, talking about running, talking about swimming, talking about golf, you know, whatever it is. 
and just watching these people grow. It's kind of cool. It's been really cool to kind of see how things have evolved and stuff like that. That's awesome. Yeah. And you actually, we talked about this before the interview, but you and I have a few connections. I have one of my former teammates from Furman University running down for the elite group in Houston now, and you work with work with that group. So that's pretty awesome. But, um, you know, yeah, they're Adrian, a good group. Yeah, they are. They're pretty good. Adrian, you work with, like you said, you work with high school runners all the way up to professional runners. Mm-hmm. In your experience, you know, you, you work with these people daily. You've been gotten to know a lot of them pretty personally. What do runners of all skill levels have in common when, when it comes to mental barriers, would you say? Okay, honestly, uh, being able to overcome doubts and see yourself for the competitor that you actually are is something that is a is a big stumbling block for the high school freshman through the Olympic trials runner. Um, and, you know, people think, oh, well, these, you know, elite runners, they don't really struggle mentally. They have it all together. You know, that's not, you know, sometimes that's the case. Uh, a lot of times, you know, not so much. Everybody, you know, at every level, you know, unfortunately, me, myself, I have to constantly work on my own mental game and stuff like that as well. So it's funny is like I'm talking to my athletes, I'm talking to myself at the same time. But uh, essentially, it's just like we, you know, can only be as good as the image we have of ourselves. So that's something that I see all the time is, um, yes, we have limits, whether that's genetics, uh, you know, environment, whatever that is. But a lot of runners tend to impose greater limits than what actually already exists. So there becomes kind of this gap between kind of where they are and where they can be slash want to be. So that's something that I see, you know, quite a bit. And uh, another one that I see when it comes to actually the racing scenario that's not so broad like the other one is dealing with what I call the critical moment in a race. And that's kind of the one where you really have to dig down deep. You really have to respond to something. Sometimes it's something unexpected. Sometimes it's dealing with discomfort. I hate to say pain because usually we want to equate pain with something asymmetrical and injury related, but just the sheer discomfort of racing and all that kind of stuff. And you you kind of have to either choose to be brave or default to what we always do. And it's, you know, it's a pretty stressful situation. And, um, a lot of times if we're not trained, uh, how to respond, we tend to default back onto bad habits. And I know as a, as a runner myself, this is something I've dealt with, especially coming back from, you know, a string of lower leg injuries and getting back in shape. I just had this thing where if somebody passed me in a race or maybe I was behind somebody that I just wouldn't used to be used to being behind, suddenly I'd feel fine. And then I'd feel terrible. And it's because I just wasn't managing that moment in a race, you know, appropriately. So I had to do a lot of work kind of on my, on myself, essentially to, you know, kind of visualizing being in that moment. Okay. What am I going to do? How do I ideally want to handle it and learning how to talk myself through it at the same time. But, um, yeah, that, that's a big one race wise is that's where, you know, we tend, the race tends to go. We, we get the, the result we want and more, or we fall back and, you know, maybe we don't have a bad race, but we kind of get into, get into that rut, get into that plateau. And when it comes to situations like that, you know, fitness aside, you know, a lot of that is in our minds. Absolutely. And, you know, Adrian, you actually said something really interesting there about having a gap between what we want to be and what we are at the moment. I think that does tend mm-hmm. to lead to a lot of anxiety for us runners. And that's mm-hmm. something that I wanted to ask you about is what would you advise runners do when setting goals for themselves, whether it be short-term goals, long-term goals, how would you advise them go about that? First thing is make sure that you have full ownership of your goals. Not that it's goals that aren't imposed by others, uh, you know, parents, coaches, peers, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's great to, you know, have people tell you, you can do this and that. But it needs to be something that um, is actually important to you. Um, And another thing is being flexible and adaptable when it comes to the goal setting process. One of the biggest obstacles that I see runners fall into is rigid goals. Okay, I'm in shape to run 
this time. And if it doesn't happen, they kind of go down that rabbit hole of questioning themselves, their training, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. So, you know, an easy way to put the flexibility into practice would be set a range of goals. And, you know, I know a lot of coaches are really good about this, but not just outcome. Um, I'm huge on process. I'm sure it annoys some of my clients, but goals within the race is, okay, what kind of mindset do I want to have? Like set a goal for having, maintaining a positive outlook. It can even be something concrete, even if it is process. Staying out of your comfort zone till, say, you're running a 5K mile 2.5 or something like that. So we're we're just stretching ourselves just a little bit further. That's often really helpful. You know, and then there's other kind of more practical process goals like running even splits, uh, you know, using positive self-talk, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Absolutely. I think it is just so important. I've talked to other runners uh, like yourself who have just said that having different, you know, plan A, plan B and plan C going into a race Mm -hmm. is is pretty vital because sometimes... Well, most of the time, right. plan A doesn't really, doesn't work out. So, right. We don't want a whole lot of emotion during the actual process of a race because it does tend to be kind of an energy leak. However, what you want to do is think about, okay, how do I want to feel after the race? You know, what is when, you know, I lift my hands off my knees and I've gotten, you know, some oxygen back to my brain. <laughs> how do I want to feel and what do I want to get out of this experience? So, I mean, that's kind of a, you know, way to kind of project yourself a little bit further, you know, into the race. And that's what we're actually going on off of is that feeling and stuff like that. And, you know, whatever you want to accomplish that day when it comes to long-term is to get started. You know, I always say, we're, you know, talk to somebody like me, a coach, something like that to kind of put some structure to it. But um, you want to take an honest assessment of kind of where you are fitness wise, where you are mentally, um, any time, work, you know, environmental barriers. You know, we want to be very realistic with this process, but pick something that scares you, but it's a scary to where you want to run towards it. You want it to be challenging and not threatening to you. And uh you know, based on kind of your current fitness level and where things are at, that's how you kind of pick, okay, distance, time, um, you know, how much time do I need to set out for training and everything like that? And, you know, you can even do something, you know, like a year out is, okay, I want to qualify for Boston or something like that. Right now, my marathon time, I'm at a 337, like for a open female or something like that. I'm close. Where do I need to be in the middle of the season? Where do I need to be, you know, here? And then we kind of fill in the gaps from there. So you want to kind of set a skeleton, but it needs to be more of a flexible, you know, type, type system because, you know, stuff happens, but these goals need to be, you know, they, they need to be there because a lot of us do need something to kind of get us out of bed at 6 a.m. and lace up, lace up and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And, you know, that that brings me to what I wanted to ask you when it, when it comes to motivation, I've actually seen in a few articles you've written, you've talked about um, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. So mm-hmm. first off, can you just explain the difference between these two and what what they mean in terms of running? Gotcha. Well, extrinsic, they're all about the hardware. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Some are, but, uh, you know, all, all about the outcome. You know, essentially, they're just motivated more from things external, whether that be, you know, others, placement, prize money, medals, that kind of stuff. And, you know, on another on another level, sea running is maybe like a social endeavor, which all of that is fine. It's just kind of where you draw that motivation from. Is there something outside that's pulling you into running? Like I know several people in the running community here were they love it, but they need that group or, you know, it was, it was friends that got them into running and stuff like that. Intrinsic, that kind of taps more into that whole like cliche, the loneliness, the the loneliness of the long distance runner (laughs) and all that kind of stuff is you do the thing simply because you love it. Mm. There may not be anything else, you know, there may not be any concrete, you know, prize for a certain performance or whatever, other than the emotional payoff and all that kind of stuff. That's enough for an intrinsically motivated runner. Gotcha. Okay. So that's pretty interesting too. Earlier you mentioned that 
you know, no runner should ever want to succeed for somebody else. It should always be a very personal mm-hmm. pursuit. How for extrinsically motivated runners, what would you advise them do to stay driven, especially if, you know, if their goal is to lose weight or if it's mm-hmm. maybe to break four hours in the marathon, how would you advise them do that? Mm-hmm. Keep setting goals, number one, even small ones. Um, And it's okay to kind of, you know, employ a little bit of a reward system for yourself. Okay, when I hit this, then, you know, I'll kind of do this for myself. Like I I identify more with being an uh, intrinsically motivated runner by nature. However, if, uh, you know, I have a race coming up and I want to push myself a little bit, I will... I'll reward myself with a new pair of shoes. Usually if I place, uh, within a, within a certain percentage or something like that, uh, and you know, I'm not going to lie. I I do, I do love me some running shoes. So I find that to be a good, uh, good motivator and all that kind of stuff. So just putting something out there like that and making it fun, find ways to keep it enjoyable is, is huge. Um, whether you're rec or high school or elite, another thing is accountability you know, with training partners, running groups, uh, even if it is just like texting somebody, uh, Hey, gee, how far did you go today or whatever? Uh, if you're really, or that, that especially comes true, like in the off season, or maybe somebody's not running very well, kind of involving others and stuff like that can kind of help you stay driven as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The accountability is, is definitely huge. It's helped me. <laughs> Help me in my own running. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and at various various junctures of our running, you know, I think I don't. There's not very many of us who are purely intrinsically or extrinsically. And a lot of us are kind of a mix of both. So it kind of depends on kind of where we're at. Like I know I've worked with some very very high level runners where I've had to, you know, make sure that they're running, that they're sticking <laughs> to their training program, and all that kind of stuff. Is just that's just where they're at. And, you know, it yeah. may be, you know, something having to do, do with training. Maybe they're coming off an injury and struggling with motivation there. Maybe life is getting in the way, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. You know, running has so many ups and downs. I feel like that mm-hmm. no runner is purely intrinsically or extrinsically motivated. So that's interesting. And if they so, tell you that, they're lying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree. I definitely agree. So earlier, Adrian, you mentioned that when setting long-term goals, you should always try and choose something that scares you a little bit. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I love that you said that. I think that's, um, you know, what runners should do, something that just really excites them is going to be something that they're going to be more inclined to work towards. But absolutely. on the other side, what would you, for maybe something that seems to scare someone into into negative thoughts, say they're going into their first marathon and they they're experiencing some kind of debilitating anxiety or, Mm -hmm. or maybe they, they're worried about not getting a PR. They're worried about hitting a wall. What would you advise them do to overcome these negative thoughts leading into maybe a big race? Oh man, this is a big one. (laughs) And this is, (laughs) yep, this is a doozy. This is a, (laughs) yeah, exactly. I mean, and this is something that I think at various points of anybody's running career, they're going to deal with, you know, not just if it's a first or anything like that. A lot of things I I tell athletes is um, you want to kind of, as you're going through your training, or maybe if you're leading into like a big race, like a marathon or something like that, start collecting positive experiences. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but you want to be able to pull positives from workouts. Uh, you want to remember the day that you kicked ass versus the day that you were, uh, you know, on the other side of the coin and all that kind of stuff. If there's nothing to take for it and there was no, you know, controllable reason, you don't need that in your psyche. Just toss it out. You know, negative thinking has been shown in studies to increase muscle tension, which in turn uh, affects our breathing negatively, affects our blood flow, which that it turns into a feedback loop because if our body's tight, our mind's tight, and then it just kind of keeps keeps snowballing from there. So what we think about is very, very important leading into a racing experience. So, take you know, taking as many, you know, tried and true positive experiences that's really helpful because you want some some good memories to draw upon when you when 
the anxiety hits or the negative thinking hits and all that kind of stuff. Another thing is how perception, how we perceive the situation that we're in is extremely powerful. Um, And that's where, you know, we can also kind of frame the situation or even frame the way we're feeling and thinking. I will uh, let everybody know who's listening. This does take some work and some practice, but this is a great technique is what you want to do is just simply accept that nerves is part of the experience of a race. It's normal. If we start if we start interpreting the way we feel a lot of the time when we run is normal, like when intervals really, really hurt. It's supposed to, Uh, you know, when, you know, we hit that critical moment in a race, it's part of racing. If we look at that as normal and not a threat, it's amazing, you know, the doors that it can open. But we start looking at it as normal and negative thoughts like kind of what I'll do is I know that a little bit of anxiety is going to hit before race. And I mean, I've been racing a decade now, so this is nothing new to me is a little bit of it's okay. We kind of want a little bit of it. You know, in a way, it's almost like skydiving for conservative types or whatever. (laughs) I always say, like, this is my version of thrill-seeking people. But uh, it is appraised as normal. And I know that when I start getting butterflies and a little bit of shaky hands and stuff like that, my mind will start going. And, you know, I just simply remind myself, okay, yeah, my brain's doing that thing again. Why? because I'm putting racing flats on and that's just kind of what happens and stuff like that. And because of that, we're better able to kind of let the negative stuff go without having, without tying an emotion to it, which that's a, you know, if, if a runner can get that down, I mean, it's going to help with anxiety. It's going to help during the race. I mean, it's just a great thing to practice. It's just being mindful about what's helpful and what's not the positive thoughts. Hold on to those. So depending on your personality, we can either kind of do kind of the mindfulness approach where you're just kind of letting your thoughts just be what they are. Or um, for those who really need a little bit of extra reinforcement is um, working on inserting positive thoughts, working on talking to yourself like you would your best friend and kind of pulling from positive experiences and all that kind of stuff. Or you can use all of the above. It just all kind of comes down to the thinking style and the situation, to be quite honest. So none of these are like one size fits all tools, but they're all great tools. After the break, Adrian will share with us a few mental exercises to consider using before your next big race. This is Sinead Hockey, and you're listening to Run to the Top at Runners Connect. When I started using gels to fuel during my long runs and workouts, I'll be honest, I couldn't find one that I didn't hate having to take. All the gels I tried were either too sweet or too thick, making them hard to consume without chasing them down with gulps and gulps of water. They also seemed to be giving me all sorts of GI issues, which obviously made long runs and workouts a lot harder than they needed to be, but even more importantly, I felt like they were impacting my overall health. That is until I discovered Excel Gel by Pacific Health Labs. Unlike most gels, Excel Gel has a thin consistency that makes it easy to take while running, and it's also all natural, completely free of gluten and preservatives you just don't need. It's also the only gel on the market that has the proven 4 to 1 ratio of carbs to protein, as well as a mix of carbohydrates to smooth glucose uptake and extend endurance. Excel Gel helps me get the most out of my long runs and workouts, and I absolutely love it, especially the raspberry cream flavor with caffeine. Right now, Pacific Health is offering all Run to the Top listeners free samples of Excel Gel. All you have to do is send an email to info at pacifichealthlabs.com with the subject line Run to the Top. Then simply request your Excel Gel samples, as well as the address you'd like them mailed to, and then you can try them for yourself for free. Again, that's info at pacifichealthlabs.com. If you want to check out more of Pacific Health's great products, you can do so at runnersconnect.net forward slash Pacific Health. We are back with Adrian. And Adrian, earlier you were talking about how every runner has a different thinking style when approaching competition. And so kind of going off that, 
I've known a lot of runners. Actually, I interviewed Nick Simmons a few weeks ago, and he was really into this. But a lot of runners mm-hmm. that thrive off of visualization. Do you use that practice with any any of your clients? Oh, absolutely. Uh, What I do when I get a new athlete a lot of the time is I just give them a quick kind of screener just on their mental skills. Um, Maybe some of them have worked with somebody like myself or have read some books in the past. Maybe they haven't. And uh, visual ability is one of them. And, you know, I think different thinking styles. Again, some people think more in pictures or, or more visual Some people are more verbal. I know for me, there's just a, there's a lot of talk going on in between my ears. So, you know, I tend to, I tend to weigh real heavily on self-talk. I do visualize, you know, personally as well, but if somebody ranks higher kind of on the visual side of things, I'm going to incorporate that into uh, our work together. And the, and here's where I think visualization is probably the most powerful Yes, we want to see ourselves crossing the finish line, looking at the clock, feeling all those emotions and all that kind of stuff. We want to see ourselves performing well, all you know, and everything. However, and I actually got this, um, I reviewed Chrissy Wellington's uh, memoir a few years ago, and she, is, she is, will visualize any possible situation. Uh, falling behind, you know, in, because she, she did triathlons, you know, somebody hits her in the swim, how does she respond? She gets a flat tire responding appropriately to adversity. A lot of runners don't want to go there. However, I think they're really missing out in a piece of their mental game is thinking, okay, I had this unpleasant experience. This is actually uh, when I was telling you about the issue I had with being passed over and over and over again, I would picture myself in that situation. And it was, it's frustrating even to sit there and think about it. And at first it didn't seem real where, you know, I'm just like, okay, I don't know if I could ever make some ground on these girls and all that kind of stuff, but I kept practicing and it became easier to actually see that situation. So we have to be able to truly, you know, have an image or be able to see ourselves being able to do these, to do these things and races in order to execute. So it's, you know, it's retraining our minds that way. Um, But it also preps us for, being able to toe the line and being like, okay, whatever happens today, I actually am ready. It's one thing to tell ourselves that it's another thing to actually be able to look, look deep into your mind and actually see that this is a reality. Absolutely. And you know, that kind of does bring me to another question I had for you, Adrian. And that was when a runner gets into a race and maybe they, they end up you know, plans don't really end up following through. Maybe they are, they're falling back or they get passed by a few runners. How would you advise them kind of regain themselves, um, get back into the race and kind of make sure that they aren't just letting it uh, spiral into, yeah. into Let, a, letting a the race run away from exactly. Them, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, and what we want to do is first is just kind of, again, go in prepared being like, okay, this is my plan. And kind of think, okay, if X, Y, or Z happens, which I do this a lot with my track runners, because on the track, it's quite unpredictable, Um, especially like I've worked with, I work with a lot of 800 runners and steeplechasers. And it's, that's part of the beauty of these events. But at the same time, it's, you have to be able to roll with adversity. So, um, you know, some common things that we discuss, you know, in my office is, um, no, the, the first thing is being able to break the race down is, OK, maybe just because you're ha- you're having a bad mile doesn't mean it needs to turn into a bad race. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's techniques you can meet with that, whether that is using a little bit of relaxation on the run. You know, you obviously can't do deep breathing in the middle of a <laughs> race, but, lo- you know, shaking your hands out, keeping your shoulders and your jaw relaxed. Those are things that you can kind of pull out of your pocket whenever you need to, you know, if we kind of get off or if the experience kind of starts taking a negative turn. Another thing is, like I said, I'm really big on kind of self-talk kind of, or as they they call it, the fancy term metacognition. Isn't that cool? Thinking about, (laughs) thinking about your own thinking is we want to go to a place and whatever you, whatever you need to hear from somebody that will keep you positive, keep you moving forward you may not have that you may, or you may be so focused kind of in your own experience that you're not going to notice if somebody says anything, 
you need to become that person for yourself. Uh, you know, beating yourself up, talking about how terrible you feel, you know, how this race is a disaster. It's not going to help you. You need to be able to, you know, develop that mental tool to where you can pick yourself up if something takes a negative turn. And, uh, you know, when in doubt, if there's something, you know, like inputs in the environment or there's triggers that's driving the negative thinking, do your best to eliminate them if you have control over them. So, you know, I'm really big on having my athletes focus on what they can control. Like I know I had an experience um, running a 10K several years back. The conditions were terrible. I mean, I live in southeast Texas. It's probably 90 degrees and who knows how humid. And uh, I just start watching my Garmin just start getting slower and slower. <laughs> and so went my head getting more and more negative. So, you know what I did? I actually, I popped the garment off and handed it to my coach at the time. <laughs> and I did, and I said, make sure I get this back. And I, you know, it changed the complexion of the race for mm. me. And I ended up turning it around, running, you know, I didn't get my goal time, but I do rate myself pretty highly with how I mentally managed the race. And there wasn't a whole lot of negativity coming after that because I eliminated the negative input. If we can do that, that's always great um, as well. Absolutely. It's just if, if something, you know, that you're thinking about seeing, you know, if there's something you can change, you know, why not make an effort to change and see what happens there? Absolutely. Yep. I think most runners can relate to having a bit of a, a hard moment during a race. And sometimes <laughs> that can result in, you know, feeling bad for yourself and kind of making it a, a bad yeah. race. Or you can, like you said, kind of pull yourself up, dust yourself off. And, and um, yeah, it's all about all about perception and management mm -hmm. in those moments. Yeah, that's so interesting. So Adrian, a few other questions I had for you. There is one that I did really want to ask you about, and that was comparison. I think most people know the saying, um, I believe it was Theodore Roosevelt that said, comparison is the thief of joy. And I think that especially in running, there does seem to be a lot of comparison. Um, and I, I'm not sure... You know, I feel like a lot of that maybe does play into social media, which is so uh, pervasive these days. But how does comparison, how is it a bad thing for runners and how should runners maybe try to avoid it and um, kind of just focus on their own self-improvement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because like with running uh, on an objective level, I mean, the sport involves comparison. There's placement, there's times, you know, it's an out, it, it can be a very outcome focused sport. Uh, which, you know, that's just one of the things that's part of what it is. But comparison itself is negative when it makes us feel less about our own accomplishments and, you know, on a deeper level, uh, ourselves in general. And that's when we know, OK, it's, you know, turning toxic and we may need to do something about that. So the social media factor, as you bring up, is it's big you know, good or bad, you know, for there's some amazing things going on. I see in social media, like uh, strong runner chicks is one of them where it's all about positive body image, all about nutrition and, you know, especially female runners in this case, lifting each other up. Then there's you scroll, you know, through your Instagram or whatever. Don't get me started on Strava because I, okay, I'm going to say this publicly. I refuse to get on Strava. Oh, <laughs> it's really? not my thing. Not my thing. Interesting. Um, really. I know myself as an athlete. We'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Some people love it. Uh, but I just know for me, that's a, that is a rabbit hole. Mm. And if, you know, what keeps me focusing, you know, focused on me is looking at my training log, looking at, okay, my small incremental improvements and stuff like that, that keeps me motivated. Uh, but say like we're looking at Instagram or Twitter or something like that is we're going to see, you know, the selfie where, you know, they have their pace. Maybe they just nailed a race or a workout and all that kind of stuff. And we look at, oh, well, I'm not as fast as that or I don't look as fit as this person. Am I doing something wrong? And then we start questioning. Maybe we're doing awesome. But we kind of, you know, it can open the door for us to start beating ourselves up unnecessarily. So if left unchecked, you know, this can become a very toxic thing. Unfortunately, it is it's it's hard to avoid on one hand, but it's not at the same time. I've actually had several athletes in the past um, and I supported their decision 
temporarily deactivate their accounts when they're going into a big competition. They don't want to see what their competitors are doing. They don't want anything that's going to deter them from their game and their plan, which um, they've actually, you know, a lot of them, they're comfortable with that. They've had some success with it and everything. Uh, But kind of on a more basic level and a little more simpler is uh, just to be an informed consumer. And you have to remember that images are just that. Everybody is on a different space in their own journey. And, uh, you know, we also in this, you know, it probably sounds kind of harsh, but when we feel tempted to compare, uh, what we need to think is what we're doing and, you know, to, to put some legs to how unfair this is, it's what we're doing is we're looking at a moment in time, like say it's a rate, an image, a race time, a performance, a workout, and quite frankly, a life that's not ours. And, um, you know, it's kind of a harsh, I remember I read that, uh, actually in my training journal and cause it has all kinds of articles and I'm just like, Oh, Whoa, (laughs) that is very direct, but it's very true. And if we were mindful of that, we're like, okay, well maybe I need to, you know, if this is not mine, what do I need to do to improve from where I am right now? So I'm, you know, I'm always encouraging athletes to kind of refocus and use these little moments where if we start feeling bad or and start feeling a little off center, that's an indicator to start kind of going back the other direction. Okay, well, what are, what am I what have I improved on lately? What am I working on? You know, what's been positive about my running? And you know, maybe if running just is not clicking, we're having a we're having a bad week, month, whatever. What else besides running do we have? You know, like I go I go back to my statement is we're people first. We're human beings first. So we have to fill that up too. Mm, I love that. And, you know, running, like I said earlier, it is so up and down that I feel like no runner should define themselves as just that because you just you can't oh, afford no. to do that. No, yep. no, no, no. And another one last comment when it comes to the social media thing is um, we just need to also be aware. We don't want to give our power away. When it comes to, because like something that I'll do myself and I'll encourage some of my runners to do is say a a teammate, you know, friend, maybe somebody you don't like that much. You see how they did instead of thinking, oh, gosh, you know, I could never do that. And then we start turning it on ourselves is just think, wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Mm -hmm. really impressive Uh, because number one, we want to build each other up in the running community. That's what makes it so special. Number two. You're not giving your power away. Congratulations. <laughs> that and there, there's so much success to go around. I feel like, you know, well, while someone might be faster than you, you're better at them in another department. So I think that's something. Absolutely. We all important. have, we all have unique strengths. Mm-hmm. We're all made differently. And, you know, if we spent more time as athletes or even just as human beings working with what we have, you know, what would sport be like? Oh, absolutely. Yep. How absolutely. much more time would we save? Absolutely. Well, Adrian, this has been such a such an enlightening interview. One more thing I did want to ask you was just if you feel like we haven't touched on anything during this interview, do you have any tips as to how runners might improve their mental capacity? Maybe if they're heading into a big race in a few weeks, what would you suggest they do to really just buoy up their mental strength? Okay. On a more global, you know, kind of long term level, really work on kind of learning yourself as an individual and as an athlete. Uh, You know, the more in tune we are with our strengths and weaknesses and the more comfortable we are, the more the likelihood of success, uh, you know, arises. And, you know, on a, you know, on on another basic level is just remember to enjoy the sport uh, for whatever it is. Like an old teammate of mine once said, love running and running will love you back in Mm. the best way it can. Um, You know, those are really important. Those are really good principles to kind of abide by. And we always want to see, you know, this is something we get to do. We want to see races and difficult, difficult, uh, you know, workout situations as uh, ways to grow. Like I love uh, teaching the growth mindset to people. Number one, that's how we just gain more grit in life. Number two, it does wonderful things for our running. If we see, uh, you know, each day as an opportunity to, or each race as an opportunity to get stronger, all kinds of like, you know, amazing things can happen that way. 
And that's how we get breakthrough performances is by focusing on our growth, focusing on getting stronger. The times will usually come. The accomplishments will come if we focus on the right things. And it all kind of comes back with runner know thyself. Mm, Absolutely. Yep. It's so important to enjoy the process, like you said. And Adrian, thank you so much again for taking the time to do this. Oh, you're very welcome. I've, I've learned so much and I know our listeners have too. So again, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. This is great. I don't think anyone would deny that running is one of the most difficult sports out there. Some days are great and some days are pure garbage. And that's why I love that Adrian talks about runners as humans that happen to run. Like she said, defining yourself as a runner above all else is usually unhealthy because, let's face it, running can be pretty unpredictable most of the time and doesn't always go as planned. That's where consulting with a sports psychologist like Adrian can help you get through those ruts and mental barriers all too common among us runners. Check out the show notes for this episode at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC578 for more information on how to connect with Adrian for a phone consultation, or if you're near Houston, maybe even an in-person consultation. I hope you've enjoyed listening to Adrian today and that you've taken away some advice that helps you reach your next big goal. Thank you so much again for tuning in today, and I hope you have a fantastic week. Until next time. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 